So I guess it's time to get started. My name is uh, Peter Reinholdsen. I'm uh, going to talk about the uh, Debian boot system and what we can do to improve it. Um, first, a uh, few notes on what I'm working on in Debian. I've been working uh, with the Debian installer for Debian EDU for quite a long time. Recently, I've been uh, working on uh, Debian GIS, Debian Java, and a few other things. I've, uh, been involved with Linux for quite some time. Even got my Linux uh, kernel patch into the kernel a few well, mid 90s. If you ever ran into the problem of uh, running out of file descriptors when uh, you wanted to uh, log into an overloaded system, I'm the one that increased that from one process to three processes. Um, anyway, today I'm going to talk about the boot system and the Debian system have several options for booting. And I'm going to um, do a summary of, uh, of uh, what the available options are and then um, point out a few problems with the current system and uh, demonstrate how we can uh, actually solve the problems. And last, I'm going to uh, uh, explain what the package maintainers can do to make this uh, a reality in the default Debian system. Part of the work I'm, work I'm going to present was uh, done by uh, uh, student uh, in the Summer of Code um, effort from Google uh, last year. Uh, he did work on uh, speeding up the boot system and this is just a fraction of his work. So the uh, Debian boot system, it's a complex and pretty important part of the uh, Linux installation because if it doesn't work, well, your system doesn't boot. It's that easy. and. Um, the uh, normal one is the System 5 boot system, which I'll go into detail a bit later. Uh, and really old alternative has been the file boot system, which is um, just the optimization of the uh, System 5 boot system. Instead of having a lot of uh, small files and symlinks, uh, you read everything from one file. That speeds up the boot quite a bit. Uh, there is the new um, effort from uh, Ubuntu to um, adjust to the new uh, order of the kernel, the event-based uh, upstart system. I'm not going to cover the problems with event-based uh, boot systems uh, in this talk. Uh, it's an uh, interesting and complex problem we have to solve eventually, but I'm going to focus on uh, another part of the boot system which is not interacting directly with the kernel. There is also the uh, initrg boot system that was uh, experimented with in Debian. It's um, uh, dependency based and uh, a lot more flexible than the system 5, well, the initial system 5 uh, boot system, but it required every packet to rewrite their current boot uh, scripts, so it never uh, really caught on. Uh, run it is a minute, is uh, two similar projects trying to uh, get <laughs> dependency based uh, boot into Debian with all similar approaches. And just to mention briefly the meta init initiative taken for a few, a few days ago to uh, reduce the uh, amount of uh, manual uh, editing the packet maintainers have to do to be able to generate uh, boot scripts for the different boot systems. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the solution, but we'll, uh, I guess we'll talk about it uh, during a boot system buff uh, during this DebConf. So to get started with the meat, I'm not sure how many actually looked at the boot system here, so I'll uh, start with a question. How many actually uh, looked into the etc rc directories once in a while? That's good. That's a majority of the people, so um, that makes it a lot easier for me to know that I'm not uh, uh, missing, missing the audience. So the point is that um, the boot system starts by running a script that starts all the scripts in rcs.d. They are started in sequence with the start scripts first. Well, well the start scripts with uh, start as argument. And when all of them are done, it continues with the uh, run level uh, directory, which is normally rc2.d, and runs first all the stop scripts, which are the, the scripts starting with k, and then the start scripts, which are all the start uh, scripts starting with the capital S. And that's like all there is to it. 
Of course, the complex part is what's being done within the scripts, but the boot system itself is very simple. And there is also the small complication that .sh scripts are sourced within the process that is uh, running this uh, script fragments, and uh, the ones without that .sh are executed directly, so they are in a separate uh, sub-process. And I'm going to skip. Um, one nice way to visualize the boot uh, system is to use the boot chart program. And this is a boot chart of uh, my base system uh, running in QEMU. And as you can see here, the uh, scripts are started in sequence and some of them are running for a longer time and some of them are just running for a short time. One can see here that the UDEV uh, system starts fairly early. That's the one uh, initializing uh, devices and loading uh, kernel modules. That's the event-based part I'm not going to talk much about. Then you have the networking starting, you have uh, uh, DHCP running, you have syslog started, you have, uh, well, different croons and getty and stuff like that. I'll just continue. So that's the current boot system in Debian. And uh, these are the script fragments that are uh, run uh, normally during boot. As you can see, there are S01, glibc, S02 hostname, and so on and so forth until S99 stop bootlog, bootlog D single, and then it continues in rc2.d with S10, sysklogd, blah, 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 S99 stop bootlog D. So it's fairly easy to get an overview of what's going on during the boot. As always, the details are uh, what's making the complexity, but the overall uh, sequence of the boot is very easy to uh, get a hand on. The problem with this um, approach is that um, the numbers are fixed. So if you uh, need to put a script between um, S30 and S30, for example, between check FS and proc PS, that's not going to be very easy. If you need the proc PS to run earlier than S30 uh, check FS, then you have to renumber proc PS or check FS. And of course, there's only an argument which package should actually modify it. So there are, it's uh, not too flexible, but it's kind of working. And the same is happening during shutdown. The uh, run levels uh, zero and six are used for uh, uh, halt and shutdown. And as you can see here, the um, scripts are running in first the stop scripts, the K scripts, and then the S scripts, the start scripts. And um, the important question to ask oneself when one, one is working with the boot system is that, is this really correct? And I can tell you that it's not. There is a small hidden bug in this list. And um, it's not for all to see, and it's not for all to experience, but those that actually experience it are really host because there is no way they can actually shut down the machine correctly with the default Debian boot system. The S20 SendSig uh, script is killing all the user processes and the uh, S31 umount NFS script is unmounting all network file systems. If you are running a network file system that is not NFS, but uh, some other system that, for example, needs the PPP uh, dial-up connection, the PPP daemon is killed by SendSigs, and the unmounting failed because there is no way to get access to the network anymore. These kind of problems affect the Debian boot system at the moment. And that's just one example. There are several edge cases where the boot <laughs> system is wrong. So as I said, the current problem is it's slightly wrong, and it's not very flexible. And it's very hard to pick the correct sequence number, because sometimes the correct sequence number involves three or more packages changing the sequence of their init scripts. 
and it only affects those that install all of them, so it's very hard to convince any of the packet maintainers that this is the right thing to do. So <coughs> that's um, probably a really hard part of the maintenance problem. And um, another problem with the boot system is the shutdown part, because um, to go back to this one, when you see this, you would initially believe, if you know the system five boot system, that the uh, K scripts are run with the stop argument and the S scripts are run with the start arguments. But that is not actually true because the Debian uh, boot system maintainers know that this system is broken. So we actually made sure, made sure that the uh, start scripts also start with the stop argument because otherwise it doesn't work at all. So the uh, S uh, scripts should actually be K scripts and uh, reordered um, to match the, well, to be ordered uh, next to the K scripts that are already there. To avoid confusing users that will try to install the uh, start script and run this, well, expect the script to be run with the start argument and discover that it doesn't actually work. And the last part is it's, possi it's impossible to parallelize the uh, boot in uh, Debian at the moment because a lot of scripts with uh, the same sequence number uh, can't really be started in parallel. They have to be started in alphabetic order. And that's not really what the boot system is supposed to, um, su supposed to um, that's not how it's supposed to behave because uh, when the sequence number is the same, they are supposed to be independent of each other. That's not, not the case in Debian. So how do we solve this? Um, one easy solution is to uh, document the dependencies in the scripts using the LSB headers, which is possibly at the moment. And when we uh, have all the dependencies uh, documented, we can actually verify that the boot sequence is correct. And if it's not, we can change the sequence numbers. And this is an example of a header. Uh, this is from the networking uh, script with a few additions. As you can see here, you have the required start part, which is uh, scripts that need to run before this script is executed. With a few magic tokens, the dollar local $LocalFS is a uh, marker to indicate that this script needs the local file systems mounted before it's executed. And that's lo mounted read-write. Uh, before localFS is uh, available, the uh, root file system is mounted read-only. And also there is some um, information about how it should stop. It needs to stop before I have up down, which takes down the interfaces. And it also need local file system to, um, to be present and writable before it is stopped. The reason is it's actually a document or it's um, putting some state information on the disk. Um, I'll skip the two next one and go for default start and default stop, which are the run levels where this script should start and stop. And as you can see from here, it's uh, run level S, which is the very early part of the boot. So networking should start very early. That might be correct or not. Uh, normal, um, well, traditional Unix systems do not take up the network in single user to be able to um, do certain maintenance jobs. In Debian, we have always started the network in the S run level, and uh, that's already been executed before the uh, single user run level is executed. So, so it's networked already in single user. Yeah. That is a problem we probably should address, but that's not too important. Default stop is zero and six, so it should be uh, stopping network when you take it into um, uh, halt and when you uh, do a reboot. And recently, the uh, to uh, X start before and stop after headers was added to this uh, system. It's a proposal from SUSE. They have already implemented the uh, dependency-based System 5 boot system. And the advantages of that header is that you can uh, specify that your script need to run before another script. For example, we have in uh, school Linux Debian EDU a script that configures X at boot time. And it has to run before KDM or XDM or GDM, so it's actually configured X before X starts. Uh, having a header like that makes it possible for your packet to document this requirement instead of asking the maintainer of the other packet to list all the packages that want to run before its, pack its script. 
there are uh, similar pro uh, features like uh, uh, postfix modules that need to start before postfix. Then you can specify it in the module that it needs to start before postfix instead of having postfix list all the modules that is present in Debian that needs to start before it. Similar for start after if you have similar requirements when you shut down the machine. And when you have this dependency information available, you can actually make a graph of the de dependencies. And that's the graph you see uh, on, the, uh, on the right side. And it looks like this when you uh, increase the size of it. Um, glibc is the um, first script that has to run. Then you need to run the, uh, to mount the kernel file systems. Then you load the uh, uh, kernel um, uh, options. And there is a bit more on the side here. Mod utils, if you have it available. Mounting uh, file systems below the dev. Uh, starting the device mapper. And as you can see, it has a reverse dependency on udev, hotplug, and discover. And the last one is devfsd. So if any of them are present, they have to start before libdev mapper. So I'm not going into detail on this graph. It's uh, just showing that the, uh, the order the script has to start in to be able to um, fulfill the dependencies documented in the header of, of each script. And when you get to the end of it, the uh, system should be ready to, uh, to go. Here you can also see an interesting feature. You have to remove the uh, no login file after KDM, XDM, and GDM is started to be able to log in. You can also see here that there is nothing within the dependencies that require KDM, XDM, or GDM to start very late in the boot. You can actually move it, move it earlier to get a easier or a better interactive feeling when you boot the machine. So your login screen pops up while the system boots and continue to start daemons that are not uh, needed by uh, the login system. So that's uh, all nice and uh <coughs> yep. Probably should get a microphone. It's just a comment on the KDM, XDM, and GDM case where you said it can be started very early. You have to keep in mind that maybe your home uh, uh, directory is mounted via NFS and stuff like that, so you probably can't mount it uh, or you can't start GDM or KDM that early because then users won't be able to log in just to... Absolutely. Th they have some dependencies yeah. on their own, so they are not installed on this system. That's why they're not showing up with all the dependencies okay. on the graph but they do depend on local and remote file systems, yes. Okay. So when these dependencies, dependency headers are present in the uh, scripts, you can uh, check the ordering and detect bugs. That's what the uh, script in inserv is doing. It's um, first uh, mentioning that uh, two uh, scripts are missing the headers, and then it's um, documenting a few uh, bugs in the ordering of uh, the early boot system. Kroon has a dependency on um, correct time set, and, time, and it's running before the time it actually is set. Um, syslogd also has a similar dependency, and it's uh, running before time is actually set. And that's using only the headers in the files for a base installation in Debian. Uh, because it's um, a lot of work to get all the dependencies and all the headers. I have implemented a system where you can use overrides in a directory included in the uh, inserv packet to uh, provide headers for the scripts that are missing them. And if you use that, you get this list. There are still bugs in it, but uh, at least um, you are not uh, guessing the dependencies on the scripts that are missing them. And here you can see that the uh, setting or reading of the hardware clock um, is done before the local and remote file system is present, even though it actually depends on both local and remote file systems to be uh, available. Um, that's a long-term bug in the boot system, which affects everything with the USR and VAR on, uh, on a different partition than slash, so not affecting too many, but it's annoying for those that are affected. But the point is that you can actually verify the boot sequence 
and detect bugs in it if you provide these headers. And this is the same uh, check for um, a desktop install. Um, very similar, a few more scripts missing it. 8plib, cupsys, hotkey setup, and anachron is missing headers, so they don't get the correct uh, dependencies. Uh, basically the same bugs in the boot system because the bugs are in the early boot system. Uh, very few of the later scripts have problems with the, the sequencing. So, detecting bugs in the boot system is one thing, and that's uh, my main argument for um, Debian implementing the headers. Without these headers, there is no way to detect bugs. If you have these headers, you can actually uh, reorder the boot sequence using the, the, the dependencies to make sure it always stays correct. And that's the uh, second part of my talk where I demonstrate that this is, this is not a theoretical possibility, it's actually implemented, it's working, and it's possible to enable in your machine on Edge today. Of course, the headers are still missing and wrong for some cases, for some packages, so you have to be very careful, but it's really possible to convert Debian to use a dependency-based System 5 boot system today. And the steps are fairly simple. You install the inserve packet, which is a port of a packet uh, SUSE is using to uh, insert all the init scripts in their boot system. Then you convert all the broken symlinks in RC0 uh, and RC6 to stop symlinks. Then you replace update RCD and you reorder RC, uh, all the RCD directories with the inserve uh, program. And then you have actually a dependency-based boot system which will stay dependency-based because update RCD, make sure that all the new scripts are inserted in the correct place in the boot sequence based on their dependency information. And the ma majority of packages already um, provide the information. So uh, for the common case, for a desktop installation, for a fairly uh, normal server installation with Samba and stuff like that, either the override files or the package packages themselves include the information required. So you can use it today. Of course, there are, I don't know how many, thousands of packages with init scripts in Debian, and not all of them are converted, but most of them are getting a correct sequence when you uh, use them. There is a small problem with the shutdown sequence, I sh should mention this, so you uh, need to be careful when you do it. It's still experimental because the uh, headers in the files are wrong in some cases, and when they are, you will get a really strange sequence. If you get loops in the sequence, you will get any kind of sequence for the boot, so if your boot system have a loop in the dependencies, do not use inserve that will break your system. And another problem is that um, when you use dependency-based uh, headers, you uh, need also to uh, make sure that you regi register the scripts in dependency order. So if your packet includes two scripts, you cannot install them in any order. You have to provide install the first uh, dependence, dependency first and then the script depending on the first one. If not, the the first one will not be included because uh, the init uh, update RCD script will refuse to install it because dependencies are missing. Anyway, to um, enable it, you run um, the D packet reconfigure on inserve with an uh, environment variable set to bad inserve hacker equals true. And when you do that, you are presented with a question. Do you really want this or not? And if you flip that to yes and press enter, this will happen. It will take a backup of everything in uh, the current boot system. It will uh, reorder the, the symlinks and uh, replace updates RCD. And when it's done, you are over to a dependency-based boot system. And I'm pretty sure none of you actually remember the look of the uh, last uh, boot graph, but um, 
I can um, tell you that the boot sequence is fairly similar. Which is good because we didn't really rewrite the boot system. We just uh, made sure that the dependencies were used to uh, provide the sequencing. This is a new sequence after reordering the uh, scripts based on the dependency information. You uh, might notice that uh, some scripts sneak <coughs> manage to get into the sequence between glibc and hostname. libdevmapper has moved uh, a bit earlier in the boot. And um, this time, all the scripts with the same sequence number can be started in parallel if the dependencies are correct. There's not much to it. You can see that the number's a bit lower and that's, it doesn't really matter because the numbers are assigned and reassigned automatically when you insert, insert or remove a init script. So the numbers are just the um, smallest one they could use. This is the shutdown sequence and uh, I can assure you that there are some bugs in it. Uh, for example, the K90 reboot script should have been renumbered. I'm not quite sure why. I suspect there is some leftovers from the SUSE boot sequence that is uh, messing up the uh, shutdown sequence in Debian. I'm still working on that one. But um, it's currently fairly correct and it's not uh, breaking the shutdown uh, for the uh, common case. And if you're not brave enough to continue this uh, adventure, you can actually undo it. As I said, uh, the first thing the script is doing is taking a backup of the current boot system, so if you uh, rerun the uh, dpacket reconfigure in serve uh, script and answer no, it will restore the backup and you will be back to square one with no changes to the boot system. If you have not installed any new packages and if you do it only once. Because if you have several backups, it doesn't really know which backup to use and you have to do it manually. But there is a tar gz file uh, in the var log where you can uh, get the old boot system and extracted. So it's not a one-way street where you are uh, completely lost if your boot system is host after running this. You can actually uh, revert it and continue from where you were. And last, how can the uh, packet maintainers assist in making this happen? First of all, make sure your scripts have dependency headers. And uh, Lintian is warning about the missing headers at the moment, so I know quite a lot of you have already included them in your script. Of course, the first step is to get them in there. The second step is to get them correct. And to get them correct, you actually have someone, someone needs to test them and use them. And that's um, another uh, important thing. If you can uh, start using dependency-based boot system and detect problems and report bugs and get the maintainers or the packages with bugs to fix them, that would be very, gr very good. There is a wiki page uh, explaining how to uh, specify the dependencies in the header. Also, you need to make sure that the uh, scripts are re registered in dependency order. Not many uh, packages have uh, several init D scripts, but if they do, they have to do it in the right order. Either ed edit uh, Debian rules or edit uh, the post inst script to make sure that the registration order is, uh, uh, well, the reverse of the dependencies. They, uh, uh, depending scripts has to be uh, last and the uh, dependency scripts has to be first. And when all this is correct, you can even run the boot system in parallel to actually speed up the boot. And then it looks like this. This base system doesn't really have many uh, boot scripts, so it's uh, not uh, showing the uh, big advantages, but when you have uh, a desktop, you will actually uh, speed up uh, with a few seconds uh, by just turning on parallel booting. So, mm -hmm. that concludes my part. Any questions? There's one over there.
one problem I've had with the current boot sequence is it supports uh, LVM on RAID, but not RAID on LVM, which obviously is one of those things depends upon how you configured your system. Um, static stuff in the init scripts is not going to be able to handle something like that. Is is there some way that this is going to be handled in the future, or am I going to have to manually tweak the boot sequence to get my system to boot properly? Uh, yes and no. Um, the override files is made in a way that uh, some override files can be included in the in-server packet, and some can be stored in etc. And if you uh, uh, have different requirements for your system, and the LVM over RAID, RAID over LVM question is not the only one. You have uh, systems where you have to start LDM, um, LDAP early because the system needs LDAP to boot, and other systems where LDAP server is just a server provided for other machines, so you can start it later. And these kind of things will have to be adjusted on a per system basis. And uh, for that setting, you um, provide your own override file in ETC to specify what your boot sequence has to be like, or actually what your de dependencies are, and then the uh, in-serve uh, system take care of uh, reordering the boot system to a correct state. Question over here. So uh, I really like the idea of um, checking the correctness of the boot sequence. And I think it's more feasible than like changing our boot uh, system to a radical new one. And so I ask you if you have ever thought about harvesting our packages, collecting all initd we have, uh, and checking the default run level at which they are run, and like doing some QA work reporting bugs against packages. I haven't thought about it, but I have not had time to uh, look into it. I hope someone will start that work when the headers are uh, available like, like they are now and actually try to collect all of them and see if they can form a consistent system. Question over there. Just a quick comment for anybody who might want to work on something like that, uh, to be aware of that uh, the um, copies of the init scripts of every package in Debian, along with many other things, are in the Lintian lab on gluck.debian.org for Debian developers. Uh, you can do all sorts of really interesting package analysis by looking through the Lintian lab, because it has an unpacked copy of every package. All right. Yep. It doesn't work. If you enable this system, uh, does uh, parallel starting of init scripts get enabled automatically, or do you have to enable that separately? That's a separate issue. I, I can show you. OK, because you said it is possible, in principle, to run the scripts that are, have the same number uh, parallel. But it isn't done by default if you enable the system. Yeah. OK. To enable it, you have to run this shell command set concurrency equals shell in etc default rcs. And that works, well, maybe that's possible to do even today with the current boot mm -hmm. system. But as the sequence is wrong, you have to modify the sequence by hand to get it working. One question over here. One over there. OK. Um, I'd like to use the chance to make a quick uh, um, drumming for the meta init idea. The idea is that maintainers should not write the init scripts by themselves or just copy them from somewhere because it's just tedious work that's going to be repeated from package to package. Instead, what we are proposing is that wherever possible, wherever the daemon is simple enough, that you just describe the daemon with two or three lines, how to run it, what dependencies there are, and then upon installation, the init script will be created and it will get the right number, hopefully, in the system. So if you think this is a good thing to have but don't want to care about it, you might want to look in providing meta init files for your packages. It's still very alpha. We're currently developing it. So if you have questions, just talk to me. I'm also interested in 
people with packages that want to test it and want to surface Guinea picks for the system. Hello. Uh, I was quite surprised in your instrumentation here that your system was it seemed to be um, CPU bound on on boot, and I, I know that my systems don't don't feel like that. I don't know whether they are or not, um, but I wondered whether this whether you uh, had any opinions about whether this is because of the simulation environment you're using, and and whether this uh, your parallelization has uh, how much of an effect that has on uh, multiprocessor systems. So I can assure you that the lack of in our in out problems on the machines is due to the fact that uh, the entire disk fits in memory. That's what I thought. Well, there's one question over there. It isn't, this isn't directly related to the work that you're doing, but uh, it seems like the work you're doing may enable it. Um, a lot of uh, Debian packages have some variety of different weird hack to say, I have this daemon installed, but I don't actually want to start it. Um, it would be really nice to have a way that we can tell our users, just use this method, which doesn't involve renaming some links by manually inside the etcrc directories. Um, you have an override file for dependencies. Does the override file also let you say, don't start this at all? No. When you want that, you actually have to modify the symlinks. That's the correct way to do it, to switch from start script to uh, stop scripts for that packet. Do you feel like that should continue to be the correct way to do it, or that it would be, I mean, and we should therefore write a tool to make it easier to do that, or that there would be a better way of doing that in the longer run? I believe that is the correct way to do it, and that, uh, for example, up, uh, update RCD should have like a disable option to do that for us. I just want to say there's a, a console tool to let users easily disable and enable scout sweeps. I don't remember its name. It, it used to be the case, I don't know if it still is, but it, if, you, if you turn off um, daemon starting, then when the package gets updated, it's a security update, it turns itself back on. No? Not if you do it the correct way. The correct way is to re rename the uh, start scripts to stop scripts. If you remove the scripts, it believes it wasn't installed and installs it. That's the behavior you are describing, but if you rename them, it actually works. Okay. This is, of course, very helpful. <laughs> Any more questions? We are planning a buff about the boot system. Uh, the time is not decided yet, so if you are interested in joining, please uh, show up here after the talk. Um, we hope to uh, get all the boot people together and talk about how we can make Upstart easier to enable and this one by def enable by default or the meta in its scripts uh, more useful and working properly. So please show up. Yeah, um, I'm the maintainer of Upstart, so I just wanted to um, add a few comments on that, but you also said it. Um, I want to, with you, uh, together organize this buff. We haven't found a time yet, but anyone who's interested maybe should come uh, up front and so we can find a time for discussing this. And uh, what I wanted to say, because um, although I'm the maintainer from Upstart and I'm, I think Upstart has great potential, there's still room for improving our current si in its system. So, I think there are two or three points where uh, our current system is lacking still, and this is, for once, I think, is the, the lack of policy. So, for, for example, the, the return codes of the init scripts, some uh, return one, zero, if, if, the, if starting a script fails, some uh, provide an option to, to give a status command, some, um, some don't. Um, some behave differently when it's running and it's started again, some fail in this case, some just do nothing, some yell. And the second point that I think is really lacking is our current logging system. I mean, with uh, the LS base package, it got a little bit better with our LSB uh, base logging function, but um, do you think it would be uh, useful to, mm -hmm. to push uh, for a better solution there? Uh, do you have ideas for that, to implement a better logging system to probably uh, integrate existing um, 
splash uh, um, demons like use splash or or uh, splashy better in that case or or other cases like uh, syslog where you can use that for logging currently it's only printed to to standard out mostly I have looked slightly into the use splash uh, logging problem but I have not really worked hard on it and I have no better solution or ideas on how to improve it. I do, on the other hand, plan to work on the progress bar situation with the system five boot system and make it easier to plug in your progress or your splash screen system into the default system five boot system to get progress information in there. Mm -hmm. There are patches floating on uh, BTS with, which seem promising, mm -hmm. but I haven't had time to actually look at it. So that's the only thing I have looked at when it comes to synchronizing between splash screens and making things yeah. easier for the default boot system. And with regard to policy, do you think we should specify it exactly, what returned codes we expect? I mean, uh, if I remember it correctly, the example is the skeleton in, in uh, Etsy NAD uh, uh, recommends different return codes, for example, than the LSB uh, specification, what to return if, if something fails or not. As far as I know, we have specified that LSB is the authoritative source on exit codes and behavior of init scripts. So, the skeleton so if the skeleton is wrong and, or not behaving as LSB specified, the okay. skeleton script is wrong. Okay. So I think LSB is the correct way to uh, behave. And when we have edge cases, cases there, we need to uh, improve LSB or specify how it should behave. What part was done by the uh, Google Summer of Code guy? He wrote the Lintian plugin to warn about the missing headers, and he also did quite a lot of testing on the uh, uh, current uh, scripts with in parallel booting, and reported a lot of bugs to asking for headers to be added, and managed to get quite a lot of packages converted to include this dependency information. So. A lot of his work made it possible to run this demonstration and prove that it's possible to do it today. And do you have an overview of how much is missing? Like, um, do we have 5,000 init scripts and 500,000? Okay. I don't know. I haven't done the math. I haven't checked the packages. Thanks. Any more questions? I guess we'll leave the rest for the buff. So uh, please, uh, if you're interested in the booth, uh, come up here and talk after the talk and uh, we'll find a time that fits everyone. Thank you very much.